like a bit of a failure because I didn't think about making book recommendations in this talk. So just so you know, I have no, I have no sales selling articles for you to look up, um, but there's plenty of that out there on the internet. So final one um, before we move on to, to the pitch competition. So met with James, had a call with him about a month ago maybe. And he said, you know, what would you like to come and talk about, about being a sales leader, about being a sales person before that? And I thought about it for a few minutes, and then I thought, well, actually, what I think would be kind of interesting is if I came and talked about automation and how that unlocks creativity in your team. Obviously, completely counterintuitive. Um, to be clear, something that I was grappling with currently in my role. So, you know, rule number one, talk about what you know and what you understand. So I'll take you through my thinking a little bit and kind of why I feel that's more important, not just for what I'm doing at Uber right now, um, but I think would apply to a, to a lot of what you're doing or what your sales managers are doing. So one of the things that's always kind of disturbed me about sales a little bit is this mystique that we build up around it, that you know a closer who's a great closer is going to be successful anywhere, and it's like the secret sauce he has that he goes in and he can, he can sell anything and he can sell it to you if you're not really buying and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I think, to be honest, that's probably one of the things that kept me away from sales as a career for quite a long time, because obviously I naturally thought, well, what if I don't have that? You know, what if I don't know how to persuade people if they're telling me no? Um, and, and that was a mistake, actually, in terms of an attitude, uh, because the reality is um, that's not how it works. Um, it's not like being a champion Olympic swimmer where you're kind of born with that natural skill or not, and we all know there's a million different ways to go about that success. Um, but at the same time, um, kind of a, a tangential um, stream of thought. I went a couple weeks ago to see the opening of Glengarry Glen Ross here in London. Yeah, uh, does everyone know what I'm talking about when I refer to that film? Okay, am I dating myself? It's amazing, by the way. Christian Slater is in the Al Pacino role. He's fantastic. Highly recommend, etc. But leaving it, and it takes place, you know, in the original era, which is kind of 1983, leaving it, I was kind of like, geez, a lot of that is still really relevant. You know, the way, again, the way we're talking about this mystique and I'm a closer and I can get them and it's amazing and I'm the star when that happens. And I thought, actually, that attitude still prevails and I think it's damaging to us. Um, when we think about how fast our industry is moving, how fast the technology that we're using is moving, you know, the supercomputers that we have in our pocket, as Karen was talking about, we need to be a lot more open to change and a lot less tied to that old mentality of how we win and how we bring revenue to our companies. And to bring this home to me and my, my personal remit right now, I've been having this um, debate and kind of restructuring conversation with what I do now at Uber. Um, my team sells Uber products like taking Uber cars and uh, getting Uber Eats delivery to businesses. Um, we sell those across a whole range of different companies. And we've been having this really exciting, I thought, conversation about how we can move more of our SME, SMB type sales through a self-service funnel, essentially. So where you have a more guided, intuitive experience on a website, you go in, um, you might get different sorts of prompts, and we say, well, right now we do that, for example, for companies between zero and 50 employees. But frankly, I see a path in the next year where we could do that for a zero to 200 employee size companies. I'm like, this is fantastic. And immediately, I intuitively thought, this means that everyone who works for me gets to work on more interesting stuff, basically. My team, though, very young, very ambitious, very astute and candid individuals, um, you know, sat there and debated with me on it because that's very much the culture at Uber. And eventually, what they said was, was yeah, Aaron, but you'll do that, and then you'll go to 500 employee companies, and then you'll go to 1,000. And because this is what we do at Uber, we make products that people inherently understand how to use, you're just going to get rid of us because we know that we're an expensive resource. Um, and that must be the end game, right? And I thought, God, what a complete misconnect. I felt bad as a leader, and I felt bad for the rest of our leadership in San Francisco that we hadn't made this more obvious to them. Because what I said was, obviously, absolutely not. We need the long tail of those businesses, but why in the world would you want to feel that you're trapped in a cycle as an individual AE of constantly basically selling through rote repetition, going to small businesses, getting them on board, getting them you know, getting them to download the app, making sure they know how to use it, all of these, you know, really kind of low value activities, um, if we talk in traditional sales terms, when instead I could be getting someone else to do that. Let's let the software do what the software is really good at, whether that's getting people on board automatically or scoring leads or generating SQLs um, or any of these other activities where we now have all these startups entering the space. And I said, because if we do that, then all of you guys can come and do the work that you actually told me you wanted to do when you interviewed here. And actually, my team is about 50% inherited talent and 50% that I hired. 
Um, and they were like, oh, okay, fine, you know. And then I thought, well, all right, they're clearly not buying this. And instead of me saying, you can do more creative and innovative work, what I did was actually sit down with each of them in my one-to-ones and said, all right, let's talk about Q4 in the beginning of next year, because a lot's changing. You might have seen we're in the news. We have some licensing situation with the city, etc." cetera. Um, I said, what would you like to work on? And actually, I proactively pitched something back to them based on what I knew from their personalities that they may want to do. And the first thing I did was I gave each of them kind of a quantifiable task that said, I want you to go and partner with some other team inside Uber. Because the first thing that goes when you're focused on all the repetitive tasks is we forget to collaborate with each other, right? So they work with our consumer rides business, our consumer eats business, the new product lines that we're developing and things like that. I said, identify a project. Talk about what would need to be done to the product to get us 10x the number of employees riding that we currently have in a way that we haven't even had the time to think about yet. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things, interesting things about it is that half of them went off and did that and they were like, I love this, this is great, I've got affiliate networks working now. We, I mean, we've never done that at Uber. It's not, it's not a traditional sales culture. So they're like, we're going to partner with these travel agencies and things like that. Fantastic. About the other half, kind of thought, was that my signal? Or was that a bit? That was a look. It was a look. Okay, fine. That was the signal. I'm wrapping up. And the other half kind of came back to me and were like, mm, yeah, I mean, I did that, but I didn't really like it. But I found this other thing because I've never talked to this other person. And this is actually what I want to work, work on, which is infinitely more valuable as well, right? Because then you learn that the thing that you've maybe thought for five years that you were really good at in selling actually doesn't interest you that much. So. In closing, to bring it back to something that my current division head in San Francisco talks about all the time, which is a bit American, um, he says, you know, all of this automation should be what frees you up to discover and kind of amplify your superpower in the way we were talking about, um, you know, diminishers and wanting to be the opposite of that. And when we first started talking about superpowers, most of my team kind of looked at each other, they were like, yeah, my superpower is selling, like revenue and hitting 2x quota and all that stuff. And it's like, no, that's not your superpower. That's a result of your superpower, right? Your superpower is whatever it might be. However you answer the question of the client, which is always, how can you help me? And there's a million ways to answer that question, is your superpower. And so I feel that all the automation is really helping them get to that a lot faster, probably five or 10 years faster than they would if they were stuck in more traditional kind of elevation of being a BDR, mid-market rep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so I just invite all of you to think about that. When all these new technologies are introduced and you think, oh, there's no need for me anymore then, or that's the thing that I was taught to do for five years, go find something else to do um, and to find a new market and a new set of skills for yourself. So that's it. <laughs>